Hi, this is Connie from San Antonio, Texas, and you're listening to Bad Dog Agility, where the naughty dogs train. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah, and this is Episode 9. Today's training tip will help you get the most out of your walkthrough. And in the second half of the show, we'll discuss what you can learn from trainers in other dog sports. Today's podcast is brought to you by Advo Agility, specializing in health and wellness, weight management, vibrant energy, and sports performance for the human half of your agility team. Advo Agility is run by Janae Cunningham, a fellow competitor who understands the demands of agility competition. Visit Janae at advoagility.com. That's A-D-V-O agility.com. There will also be a link to our site on our podcast page. Today's training tip is actually a tip that I got from my very first agility instructor, Kim Donnell, at Wagon Tail's dog training just outside of Austin, Texas. She taught me to walk the course from the dog's point of view as my first walkthrough. I still do that to this day, and I'm pretty much the only one out there doing it. I literally step over each jump. It's a real pain when you're going right after the 24-inch dogs and all of the jumps are set at 24. I much prefer when I'm following the 12s because it's much easier to step over the jumps. But this is something that I do, and even Esteban doesn't do it all the time. I do it every now and then. I don't do it as much as I used to. Uh, usually I'll squat down on the ground in places like the end of contact equipment and coming out of tunnels. I'll really get down on the ground and I'll take a look to the left and I'll look to the right and I'll see what options are available to the dog. And I'm trying to guess what direction is my dog going to come off of this obstacle and what are they going to see that maybe I'm not seeing. And I do see actually a lot of people that will stand at the end of a tunnel to see what their dog sees as they come out. But I don't see anybody doing it for the entire course. And most of the time, it it is just an exercise in memorizing the course. But every once in a while, as you walk the course from your dog's point of view, you will notice a trap that was not apparent on the course map and that you wouldn't have noticed from the human point of view. So you'll come over a jump and realize that your dog is looking at an obstacle that you wouldn't have even considered to be a trap. So I still find it to be a useful exercise. It helps me memorize the course, and every once in a while it pays off big. I think that's a really good tip. I like to memorize the course before I start my walkthrough. Here in the States, you generally get about eight minutes to walk through. Everybody has access to a course map. So you memorize the course using the course map, kind of put together a rough outline or plan, watch other people run the course if you have that opportunity, and then when you get in there, you can immediately start to um, plan out your own handling. But, like Sarah said, you can take that first minute and just do one walkthrough from the dog's point of view, and you never know, you might uncover something that you didn't see before. And here's a bonus tip, because you made me just think about it, and that is to not be committed to your plan before the walkthrough. A lot of people will look at a course map, and they'll decide how they're going to run it, or they'll watch a lot of dogs run before them and make some decisions about how they're going to run it. But sometimes when you get down on the field, things will be set up just slightly different, and you have to be willing to look at what is there and maybe adjust the plan that you had started to formulate in your mind. Good tip. Bonus tip. Good bonus tip. And now we're going to talk a little bit about what we can learn from trainers outside of the agility world. When I look at dog sports in general, I really feel that agility is the fastest evolving dog sport out there. I'm an agility person, so I won't argue that point. Well, I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just that agility today is very different from agility five years ago, and that's very different from agility when it first started. I think in a lot of the other sports, although you've seen changes Uh, they've been slower. I think part of that is due to just sheer numbers. You know, agility's got a lot of competitors, a lot of competitions, shows every weekend. Uh, It's very accessible for people. Uh, That might not be the case with, say, field trials or Schutzen trials or tracking trials. 
Well, I think also the very nature of agility is so different. The fact that every single time you go out there, the course is going to be different. There is no prescribed routine that you're doing. And that really forces a lot of innovation and a lot of very interesting training. Now, even though agility has evolved very quickly compared to some of the other dog sports, I think that it has itself been greatly influenced by trainers outside of agility, even trainers who have never competed in agility. Absolutely. For us personally, we have a lot of big influences outside of the agility world. And I I get the feeling that that is becoming more and more common, that the agility competitors are starting to see that there's a lot that they can learn from other dog sports. So what's your biggest influence? I know, but the audience doesn't. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think to back up a little bit, when agility started, there was a very heavy influence from obedience. Even a lot of the obstacles that you see today are derived from the sport of obedience. For example, the concept of having a table out in the middle of a course where your dog has to stop and either sit or down. That has obedience written all over it, and I am not a fan of the table. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad we don't have the table at nationals, and and I think at a lot of big European competitions, I I don't often see the table either. I think it's a remnant, a remnant from obedience, and we should just get rid of it. (laughs) Strong stance. Well, I've heard stories from from back in the day that everyone did the weave poles, I, I think probably with your dog on the left side. That's the position your dog would be in to heal in an obedience exercise. And it was revolutionary when the first competitor suddenly sent their dog in on the other side. Right. It's just a rumor. I don't know if it's actually true. Maybe one of our listeners out there can verify that for us. But I think a lot of that influence you get from the obedience side is about consistency, control, and we've come a long way from that. The focus now very much is is performance and speed, and we've kind of moved away from that. Well, I think the strengths of obedience are obviously going to be control. It's going to help with uh, your, obviously, like you said, the table you need at the very least to sit in a down. And your start line stay, which we've talked about before, is very important to agility. Every course starts with the start line stay. But I think obedience also can bring a lot of great relationship building to the team. One of our big influencers was doing an an introduction to competition obedience course with our dog. And we had no plans to actually compete in obedience. But this course focused so heavily on relationship and on games and on your dog's attitude, keeping them up and happy. And that's what we wanted out of agility too. So we got a lot out of that course and we still start all of our dogs with something like that. But I think that where obedience training helps a lot with the relationship and you do have a happy, enthusiastic dog, there are other sports that can bring a little bit more of an edge and a little bit more speed and drive to your training. And for us in our training, that sport has been schützend. As a group, Schutzen trainers are very, very concerned with with the drive and the motivation that their dogs have. They're very careful to preserve what drive their dogs have. They carefully cultivate it and grow it from puppyhood. And it doesn't hurt that we have had working breeds in the past. So we were kind of working with our dogs' natural drives and kind of looking into the types of training that would be very good for our dog. But even with the Border Collies that we've had since then, we've continued to take the same Schutzen-based training and apply it with our Border Collies as well, especially with getting our dogs to tug really well, which is something that we find to be invaluable in agility training. It is such a great tool to have a dog that loves to tug. That's right. I think um, a lot of agility competitors think of motivation in terms of the equipment. They'll say things like, my dog really likes to do agility. My dog really enjoys taking jumps or doing the obstacles or being out there in the ring. 
And I think a top Shih Tzu trainer might turn around and tell you, well, yes, my dog enjoys biting in the sport, but what they're really doing it for is the opportunity to bite this toy, to interact with me while tugging, something along those lines, to have some kind of very strong reinforcer that they're then able to offer as a reward for the dog doing really cool things like guarding people and finding people and tracking and biting and that sort of thing. And I think that's really what agility is about. In agility, if your dog reaches the point where nothing is more rewarding than taking the obstacle, you might be in a little bit of trouble because you have nothing to offer the dog if they choose to keep taking equipment, you know, without your direction. I think also you can have a dog that's happy and enthusiastic and not necessarily running their fastest. So that's where we bring in some of that drive training and and try to get that all-out speed out of our dogs. And I think that we're not the only ones that are doing this. We're starting to see, um, for instance, one of the Schutzen trainers that we really like is Ivan, how do you say his last name? Ivan Balabanov. Balabanov. Really like his videos and his whole philosophy of training. And he has videos available that you can buy and instantly watch on his website. Well, now you're starting to see Sylvia Turkman hosting her videos on his website. So there's clearly some crossover in audience. Yeah, it's not just Ivan. There's another guy out there in the Schutzen world, Michael Ellis. He's a great teacher and and competitor. And actually, Clean Run is carrying his stuff now. He's got several different DVDs and things and online courses out. But if you go to Clean Run and you type in Michael Ellis in the search box, you're going to get a return of three different products. And one is Advanced Concepts and Motivation. It's a DVD. He talks about how you can uh, work with any breed in any dog sport and learn how to motivate your dog. The second is The Power of Playing Tug with Your Dog. And that's been very, very helpful to us in agility. And the third one is the power of training dogs with food. And again, he's also primarily a Schutzen competitor and trainer. When you look at Ivan Balabanov and Michael Ellis, these guys are very good with the mechanical skill of tugging. And I think if you watch some of their stuff and you do what they're doing, it's going to help you be a better trainer as far as getting your dog motivated, getting them to tug and setting up a structure for how to teach tugging and when to use it. It'll really help you out. And as an instructor, I've seen that getting dogs to consistently play with a toy as a reward can really be a big stumbling block for a lot of students. And it's been a big stumbling block for myself with some of my dogs. But it is just so much easier to have the ability to use a toy as a reward than to use food and agility, but just by the nature of it, by running and by the placement of the reward. You don't always want your dog taking a reward from your hand. And while you can throw food, and we have, it's clearly not as easy to work with as a tug toy. Yeah, I think that's another cool thing that the Schutzen trainers are doing. They they do a lot of food training. And like a lot of the motivational obedience people, they use food in what they call the learning phase, and then they kind of move on from there. But when they feed their dogs, they're not just bringing the food to the dog. What they do is create kind of an event. You know, the whole reward process is like a big instinctual deal where the dog is going to go and chase and have to work a little bit to get that food. And I think that turns it into a very different thing from passively waiting for you, the handler, to bring the food and put it into their mouth. So we're seeing a lot of crossover with Schutzen, and that's one of our personal big influencers. I think the other place where we see a lot of influence is from clicker trainers. Sylvia Turkman has done a great job of bringing trick training into agility training and using that for building rear end awareness, for helping dogs learn how to learn, for keeping their motivation up. And a lot of that stems from clicker training and and clicker trainers in general. Uh, And one of our big influencers there has been Kathy Steo, who I saw at Clicker Expo, and she just blew me away. And to my knowledge, she doesn't do anything in agility, but she is an extremely wonderful dog trainer. 
actually started with, with whales, much like Karen Pryor did. And the way she explains things and the influence she's had on us has been very huge. Yeah, so Schutz and Trainers have been helping our tugging, building motivation and drive. Your clicker trainers have been helping you with the relationship, teaching your dog how to learn. And the obedience trainers have always been there helping to teach relationship and control. I think one of the reasons that Susan Garrett has been so successful as well is that she is a diehard agility trainer and competitor, but she also has a huge background in operant conditioning. I don't hear her talk about clickers much, but if you have been to her seminars and if you've listened to her talk about advances in dog training, she's basically giving you a broad overview of operant conditioning and how it can be applied to agility. And I think that's part of her appeal and part of her success is that she is a huge influencer for pet people who maybe don't do agility and also a huge influencer in the agility world as well. So she has this huge audience and uh, has a lot of valuable things to teach both those audiences. I think that's a really great point. It was a real turning point for me in both my relationship with my dog at the time with Sammy, the Rottweiler, and not just the relationship, but how I viewed dog training. What Susan did was create a world where dog training became scientific. There were scientific methods to obtain reproducible results so that whether I had a Rottweiler, a Border Collie, or a Golden Retriever, I could go out and get the performance that I was looking for just by using methods that were not based on myth, voodoo, anecdote, personal experience, but real scientific principles that I could use, teach to someone else, or that I could learn from someone else. There's a common thread here that underlies everything that obedience, shoots and trainers, and clicker trainers are doing, and that's the importance of positive reinforcement, really developing a primary reinforcer that your dog is going to love, that you can use as a motivator to really trade for agility. You say, hey, you do this obstacle sequence, and I'm going to give you this really great reward. When I think about how we started, especially having a Rottweiler, positive reinforcement was how you taught everything, but positive punishment was how you ensured a precise, reliable performance. And I think for myself and for the entire sport of agility, that's no longer the dominant thinking. And the factor that has changed that and doesn't really exist, in my opinion, in other sports is speed. Agility is very objective, especially when compared to the other dog sports. So if you look at confirmation, if you look at field trials, if you look at obedience and schutzen, points are given and taken away on a very, very subjective basis. But if you go to an agility ring and you have two dogs and one of them takes off for jumps early, is running all over the place, you know, the handler looks really frantic and she's screaming at the dog. But they run faster than a dog that looks smoother, the handler looks calm and controlled. That's the end of the story. There's no style points in agility. The faster dog wins. Speed is the bottom line. And when you are looking at positive punishment and positive reinforcement, it has been my observation that dogs need to have the ability to run all out, 100% all out, without stress, without fear without anxiety, if they have any of those things, any kind of fallout from positive punishment, they're not going to be able to compete at that level with 100% effort. I think that was a really great way to explain it, that, that speed is king and that it's really hard to get 100% out of your dog if there is any concern or worry. You also need your dog to have the ability to make their own decisions. You need to give them a framework to work in. You're giving them cues all the time, your movement, your speed, but you can't micromanage every little thing. You set lines and you let your dog go. And too much positive punishment will often result in a dog that looks to you to make sure that they're doing the right thing at all times. And 
that's just not as fast as the dog that trusts you to have put them on the right path and then they take that path all out. Everybody's got their own training style. Personally, I like to use as much positive reinforcement as possible because I think it makes my dog fast, motivated, gives them a lot of confidence. And I like to stay away from the positive punishment as much as possible. I don't like to create any kind of doubt or fear or have them have any bad experiences with any of the uh, equipment or handling moves. It works out well for us. Exactly. All right. Well, we want to know what works out good for you. So post your comments. You can post on the blog, post on Facebook. We would love to hear what has influenced you, especially from sports that we're not familiar with, maybe herding or fly ball or uh, field. If there are some things in those sports that you found to be really helpful in your agility training, let us know. Freestyle dancing. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. Let us know what's, uh, what's been working for you. You can sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss any articles or podcasts. We still need people to introduce the podcast, so go to the webpage and click on the big orange button. It's really easy. You just call a phone number and leave a message, and then you become immortalized on the Bad Dog Agility podcast. And that's it for this week's podcast. Happy training. <laughs>